Welcome to the Facts vs. Feelings podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Dietrich, and I'm joined by my co-host, Sonu Varghese. Cutting through the noise in 30 minutes each week with Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist, and Sonu Varghese, VP Global Macro Strategist, taking out the boring and helping investors focus on what really matters. A quick note before we start the show. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Carson Partners, the division of CWM LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a very special edition of Carson's Facts versus Feelings with Ryan and Sonu. Sonu, we have a repeat offender in the house, in the chair, so to speak. Do you, I, I, you, you're, you're tight with Cliff. You want to introduce who we have today on the podcast, Cl- Sonu? No, yeah, Cliff Hasden is one of the most influential figures, I think, in finance and investing, safe to say, founder, managing principal, and I, I think I'm getting this right, chief investment officer at AQR Capital Management. Uh, I'll, I'll just say this, AQR publishes really high quality research, you know, looking at market returns, economics, behavioral finance, and now even technology and machine learning, all of this stuff. But it's one thing to do all that. It's one thing to implement that and then implement it successfully. That's what AQR has done. I think Cliff sort of embodies all of that. And the nice thing about Cliff is Cliff's out there, out here. It's not hidden behind a curtain like a lot of other portfolio managers. So welcome, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you. It's funny that you stumbled over CIO because (laughs) I stumble over it. I don't think I ever officially was given or took that title. I think we had to fill it out on an RFP once okay. and I was the logical choice. And I think I, that's so that, I'm, I'm the managing principal, but I think, I, I do think, I do think CIO was an accident. There you go. <laughs> I, I think CIO is fair, right? So yeah. I'll take it. Hey. <laughs> you know, you, you know, they just throw titles at us and we go with it, but Cliff, we are really excited. I like, we kind of, talked about a minute ago you're a repeat offender you joined us last september um we had a lot of fun in person and we're honored and delighted that you've come back our podcast like i said this is episode 95 so we're inching closer to 100 weekly podcasts have fun just just so you know and we talked before but you know this this um podcast goes out specifically i guess i'd say for financial advisors but obviously a lot of investors listening out there as sure. well so in the last year cliff i mean i know we've got questions that you know they told us supposed to ask what's new what's new since we saw you last september what's what's happening and it's had to be work related personal what car you bought i don't know whatever what's I new see, in your world I'm that nobody add, else knows oh I'm go ahead yeah i had one thing which i oh, see behind cliff right now if you're watching this on the youtube channel okay i see oh, this is dangerous i, I didn't put up my fake him? background <laughs> yeah. this is okay. my actual office for all oh its warts and all yeah, yeah. so if, if you are a fan of hot sauce i mean most of you listening to this probably have heard of or like sri raja and there's a sri raja shortage and now looking behind cliff i could probably understand why because i see i can count like three <laughs> bottles at least of sri raja <laughs> cliff what's going yeah, on yeah now, now i'm like a covid hoarder right it's something <laughs> i my standard i'm sharing way too much but i have my sriracha and I have my Pepsi complete. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and they, uh, they kind of go together. <laughs> That's, uh, That's so funny. Uh, have you ever had the um, shrimp cocktail in Indianapolis, Cliff? Um, what's that place? St. Elmo's. You ever heard of this? You know what I'm talking I about? I have been you to St. Elmo's Steakhouse. So you had the cocktail. You had the cocktail sauce that burned. I right did. Through you. I did. So yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I had that a couple nights ago. I was in Indiana- in Indianapolis. Had it. it was like hotter than ever. But if you like hot stuff. That that is um, about as hot as it gets uh, right there. Now that's a fun uh, place too. Kind of been around forever. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Kind of kind of like some of us, I think, at this point. <laughs> We've been doing this for a while. But all right. So so uh, what is new in the last year in the life of Cliff? What, what's happening? Um, well, this is on the personal side, but my wife mm-hmm. and I became empty nesters. Okay, cool. Um, Congrats. that's um, congratulations. She, thank you. She's traveling with me, which is really nice. Um, go on these kind of insane work trips and have a mm. companion has, has definitely made my life uh, somewhat better. I still have to spend most of the day talking to people like you. So it's, it's not, Sorry. you know, it's not <laughs> relaxing, uh, but it, it's, it's wonderful to have her along. Um, business has been good. Um, if we want to talk investing, uh, last year was particularly gratifying in odd kind of way, because I'm going to brag now it, it it was considered a disastrous year for value investing. Um, the Magnificent Seven, the indices had, you know, I don't know if records, but near record 
spread. And we're back. Cliff, we lost you for a few minutes. Did, were you that bored with this already? I mean, you, you left like record time. We've had people leave. That was record. Yeah. Technical di difficulties. My computer science degree is from the 1980s, yeah. and I'm I'm not up on making this stuff work. I fight with it. I will say this. I was worried it'd be me because at the bottom right of my computer, it's got that thing about it's going to do a forced update. It says it's like not going to happen yet, but I'm worried. If this happened before, where it forces me yes. to do an update, but hopefully not. But Cliff, um, welcome back. We'll, we'll do a round two here. We, I think where we kind of stopped, you were talking about how poorly value did last year, but really it wasn't yeah. as bad for, for AQR. We're going to take it, take it away from there. It, no, more than not as bad. I was bragging it was good. There you go. Bragging, um, there we go. Yeah. If, first, and I've written, I have a piece on our website with a title. I'm going to mangle it slightly, but it's very close to, we are not just about value in parentheses, except occasionally when we are. Um, basically, within six months of the peak of what I would consider a bubble in the dot-com bubble, 99, 2000, and the COVID bubble, Value dominates your, uh, the life of a of a diversified investor that has any decent weight on it as a concept. In anything like more normal times, and it may not be normal, but I think times are more normal now. Um, our correlation with value is fairly low. It's about 0.2 uh, over over the long uh, over the long horizon. And it gets very high in bubbles for first first for bad and then for good and round trip for good. Um, but so. Basically, all the non-value stuff worked fairly well last year. Maybe a little more interesting, the value stuff actually worked fairly well last year. When people look at value, um, particularly in the U.S., they, they look at a very uh, very specific, narrow thing. They look at a narrow index. Uh, it's dominated by the, the famous Magnificent Seven and whatnot. What a quant does is far more diversified in any portfolio, be it value or more general multi-factor, we might have 750 names long, 750 names short, around the world, diversified by industry, matched almost by industry, long and short often within the same industry. So again, when you're in totally crazy periods where everyone's throwing out anything that looks cheap at all or buying everything that looks cheap, we're going to look like other value strategies. That it, the, the whole world's kind of moves together. And again, I think the round trip there ends up being good. But in anything like normal times, those differences can become huge. And last year, not taking big industry bets, doing mostly relative value, meant almost by definition, you don't have a big Magnificent Seven bet. Very large diversification means, um, I don't think, I, I think we actually had some longs and shorts among the Magnificent Seven, but if you were short all of them, that's seven out of 750. Um, it just doesn't matter that much. And finally, uh, it's a very simple one that really I deserve no credit for, but global value did better outside the U.S. than it did inside the U.S. So I, I, I do think the version I'm talking about is a more generalized, better version of value than just, you know, the MAG-7 against everything else. And it was a nice, fun year in that the non-value stuff worked uh, and you got rewarded for doing value, uh, I think, I will brag a, a little bit better than than the than the famous indices. In, one thing you mentioned there was you know, like when times are crazy and at certain periods. I mean, you like to diversify, but you like you know. Uh, I, I think way back when you'd said something about sending a little and maybe sending a little on the value uh -huh. side, right? Uh, how do you measure? Like, how do you tell when times are crazy, right? I, I mean, sure, anecdotally, it can seem crazy. I mean, if if any of us are on Twitter, it always seems crazy. But uh, yeah. how do you how do you measure crazy? Um, I think my wife wonders that at home a lot <laughs> about me. <laughs> no, it, I I could just be flip and go. You know, any period we're losing money is crazy. <clears throat> that would be false. For instance. <laughs> If you lost money because of fundamental momentum strategies, buying what's been getting better and selling what's getting worse, if a lot of those things had more reversals than continuations, mm -hmm. that's what a momentum strategy loses. Right. I, I wouldn't say losing in that case is crazy. I wouldn't say if value loses because the companies underperform. Let me give you, this will be a really stark example. 
value in a very general sense. And here I don't necessarily mean AQR specific. I, I mean those indices maybe I was making fun of before. But most forms of value have been subpar since the GFC. Right. Now, for some like ours, there's been a fairly big comeback in recent years. But still, post-GFC has not been a great period for value investing in general. From immediately after the GFC through about 2017, so eight years or so, mm -hmm. the way we describe it is value lost or, or even didn't outperform, depending on your versions, because it got it wrong. The fundamentals came in poor for value companies and stronger for growth companies or expensive companies. A multi-factor process can easily survive that because value is its not a majority even of what you do. Um, so that was actually a kind of pleasant period for us, even though value was, was, was not good. And I certainly wouldn't say that's a crazy thing. Value lost for eight years. And that might, you might go, oh, my God. I go, it's not crazy. The, the, you, you know, if, that, if value works on average, and I believe it does, it's because people are overpaying for the better companies. They rarely are overpaying for worse companies. That does happen, but it's very rare. Most of the time, the companies that a value strategy doesn't like are, in fact, better in all the ways, you know, uh, growing their margins, uh, past growth, higher profitability. They are too expensive, though, relative to that superior, uh, the superiorness of the company. That's on average. Sometimes it's the case that you, you, you buy cheap looking things um, that on average they shouldn't be that cheap and they turn out they should have been cheaper. Mm -hmm. I would not say that's crazy. The next three years for value, maybe two and a half years if you take off the few months on both ends, value got destroyed. Any way you measure it, our way, mm. ways that I think are less wonderful than our ways, didn't matter. If you cared about price at all, you did not have fun uh, from early 18 through late 2020. There we got to observe something. It was not the fundamentals. The way we measure it, the fundamentals actually probably came in a little bit better than we would normally expect for value versus growth. But we saw prices explode, the differential in prices between expensive and cheap. Expensive is always more expensive than cheap. Sure. That's a tautology. You've come up with your own way to measure it, so there's always going to be a difference. But sometimes they're relatively compact. Sometimes, of course, they're about their average, and sometimes they're out to here. By the end of 2020, the way we measure it, we eclipsed the tech bubble, and we saw the widest disparities ever. Um, we also did all kinds of... Uh, what could we possibly do to justify these disparities? What growth assumptions do you need going forward? And we couldn't come up with anything within hailing distance of reasonable. Hmm. At that point, I'm willing to go, this is kind of crazy. That's crazy. Uh, but it's not a bad period for parts of your strategy. It's not a bad period for your whole strategy. Um, you have to look deeper. C crazy is that just about retirement? Now, yeah, the crash of 1987, October 19th, if you believe stock returns were normally distributed, that was a fairly crazy day. Um, so there are things you could just do on returns, but most of the time with real life strategies, you got to go deeper. If you see returns that are big enough that you could declare them crazy, you've probably done something a little bit wrong if you're just doing it on returns. You're, you're being too surprised. So that was awesome, Cliff. I mean, one thing I think is interesting right now that just happened on CPI Thursday, right? We had CPI. We saw small caps outperform large caps by more than 4%. Yeah. Six standard deviation event, implying it should only happen once every 506 million days. Now, like you just said, October 87, talk to us a little bit about how markets aren't so normal. They're not normally distributed. You do see these big moves that you shouldn't normally see and how that kind of plays into how AQR looks at the world. Yeah. Um, this, this is a fact and one thing, and you guys aren't doing this, uh, but critics of kind of academic or, uh, or quantitative finance sometimes kind of a little mean about it. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they want to make it sound like the academics and the quants don't know this. Mm -hmm. My mentor, Gene Fama, co-chair of my dissertation, godfather of the efficient market 
hypothesis, wrote his doctoral thesis. This is uh, somewhere probably in the 1960s on the fact that daily stock returns were not normally distributed. They were so-called fat-tailed. Mm -hmm. So this is not new stuff, particularly at shorter horizons. And I think it's probably the case that the shorter you go, the more extreme this is. We are no longer in a anything vaguely a normal world. I'm not sure we're ever in a world with a normal distribution yeah. perfectly holds. Uh, if I had it, these are hard things to to prove because rare events, by definition, are very rare. But I would venture a guess that even in longer horizons, there's some fat-tailed nature vis-a-vis uh, -vis a normal distribution. But at short horizons, at the daily level, yeah. I, I I wouldn't say six standard deviations are a dime a dozen. Um, but they're closer to that than a black swan. We do see that. We've seen it many, many times. Um, you know, for for us, I'll tell you, that day uh, was a decent day in overall stock selection, but wasn't super great, wasn't super terrible. Okay. Because some factors, well, often on days like that, if you're multi-factor, sure. something's offset. Um, and, you know, it was a very good day for small, a very good day for value. Yep. It was a very poor day for momentum. And, you know, you, you'd always like to have all the signs be right, but that's rare, especially when you have negatively correlated aspects to your strategy. Hmm. So I do think a well-diversified strategy um, can be less fat-tailed than, than, than a very thematic single ver part of the strategy, but I don't think anything gets you away. Um, first of all, if you're looking at things on a daily basis and overreacting to them, you're already going down a bad path um i look at the the uh, how we're doing on a minutely basis <laughs> while lecturing the whole world on <laughs> on being long term there you go um one of my kids recently asked me saying you know how often should you look at your strategies mm -hmm. i'm like every few years um yeah, and that's ridiculous that's... of course as someone running it i need to look at it fairly often just it's really bad to talk to clients and they go how you guys doing and I go, well, three years ago we were doing well. I haven't checked. Um, that, that would be <laughs> that odd. That doesn't go well. <laughs> but, but in terms of actual learning something about the strategy, you don't learn a lot of short horizons um, unless things are an epic disaster. Uh, you know, in, in, in certain famous hedge fund blowups, when you lose all the money in three days, you did learn something. Um, you didn't enjoy learning it, but you learned something. Sure. Short of that, we, we statistics, it's distressing and depressing how long it takes to actually learn something from pure returns. And rare events, we know they occur, but by definition, they're harder to learn about. You try to protect yourself, you try to do reasonable things, and then you live with them. I'll just chime in and I'll let Senator jump in. One of my favorite quotes, Howard Marks, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want and kind of what you just said in those three-day yeah, blow-ups yeah. of hedge funds i guess a, a lot of experience came in i uh, go ahead sonu no speaking of experience like you've seen you've been doing this for a long time so you've seen the 99 bubble and the crash you've seen the gfc great financial crisis 2008 2009 then that period 2018 to 2020 which sub, as you described kind of crazy how do you think when you're looking at this stuff do you go like oh i've seen this before things will be okay or is part of you how what how much of your thinking is around I wonder if something's changed? Have markets gotten more irrational or inefficient? You you always have to have to do both, right? You you have to start from the premise. You you're presupposing it's a bad period. Let me say for the record, but if you see an anomalously good period, and we've seen those two, meaning outsized, um, not enough to make you go, oh my god, this is but, but you should carry out this exact same exercise when things are considerably better hmm. than you expect them to be. If you're being dispassionate about it, that's as much of a surprise. And sometimes things reverse. Sometimes you're on the right side of, say, a revaluation. And what you do may be as expensive going forward. So I'll, I will focus on the bad cases because that's just human nature. Uh, but if you're being disciplined about this, you never want to go, oh, we, made, we we had a plus three standard deviation three-year period. Yeah, that just happens and move on. You should go, what happened? Um, you know, was the strategy even better than we thought? That's the most pleasant result. Uh, was it a revaluation where now maybe it's not so attractive going forward? And we can, you know, you should consider changing what you do 
as you, you, you probably never should overreact to, to, to even medium term performance, but you should react rather symmetrically to it. With that said, the trillion dollar question when you see a bad period, because that's when the pressure really comes, is, is do you stick with this or do you make a change? Um, and you can't have a generic answer. You can't say we always stick with it because that's saying the world never changes. I think it is fair to say, at least in my experience, that most of the time when the world says it's all different now and it's all changed, it has not been the case. But if that's true nine out of 10 times, you don't want to take out a one out of 10 chance of blowing up everything you've built because, hey, usually it doesn't change. That is terrible. What you do when you see anonymous, uh, anonym, anonym, uh, anomalous, I've been saying that word since I was 19. You think I'd be able to nail it. When you see weird, I'm just going to say weird returns, um, particularly over a medium term kind of period where it's starting to hurt, you have to try to figure out why. And is there a story? Um, a, again, the, the most current example is the kind of extremely painful early 18 through late 2020 period for quantitative value investing. I say quantitative value investing because that's really just about multiples. Um, a more a more general, I think a better version of value investing is the Graham and Dodd kind of version that also considers quality and risk and it's more holistic. Um, that died too, by the way, over this period. Uh, but trying to buy things at bargain multiples and trying to sell things at expensive multiples was an utter disaster for that period. And you have to roll up your sleeves and go, why? First, you have to consider every possible explanation out there. You can self-generate some. The world will be very good at providing you with many to test. I promise you, when a strategy is done poorly, our industry is excellent at explaining why it was obvious it was going to do poorly and now it's going to do poorly forever. Um, it is equally skilled at doing that when a strategy is done well. Again, it's symmetrical. Um, so... When value is doing poorly, we'd hear stories like maybe it's intangibles. Uh, maybe value strategies are measuring the intangible values of companies well, uh, so the, multiple, uh, the multiples they normally look at don't apply. We thought really hard about this. First, in theory, it really shouldn't work that way. Intang measuring intangibles poorly would reduce the sharp ratio of a strategy. It would introduce noise. But it wouldn't mean you systematically lose for three years. It would mean you're throwing darts uh, or close to throwing darts. So right there, you're like, that's probably not it. But then we actually took it rather seriously. Um, we did th simple things like we came up with measures of intangibles. One of the most famous, one of the most important intangibles is R&D spending. Um, in general, that's an expense um, on the income statement when you could argue at least part of it should be capitalized on the balance sheet. So instead of looking like a low earnings company, you should look like you're investing. And that would make you look not as expensive. We took the 5, 10, and 20% of our universe that had the largest intangibles as we could measure them and threw them out of the current portfolio and the back test. Turns out you do a little worse historically because if you throw out 20% of your universe, you can't diversify quite as much. That's That would happen, I think, if you threw out any 20% of your universe. Why hamstring yourself by throwing out some? But you did pretty close to the same. You had pretty close to the same disaster, 18 through 20, and pretty close to the same cheapness level at the end of that terrible period. So we got, we did some other things too. Um, that critique applies most stringently to price to book one of the most venerable, but but maybe not the best single standalone value measure. I won't diss it to the extent some other people do. I'd still have that in my composite of many value measures, but price to book, it applies directly to. Price to earnings, it has a smaller effect, but it can affect earnings also. There are value measures like price to sales. Uh, you want to do enterprise value to sales actually, but so I'm going to call it price to sales. It's easier. Price to sales is unaffected by this. It's sales. It has nothing to do with, with with intangibles or how you account for things. Price to sales strategy has adjusted for industries is probably one of the stronger value strategies long term and did just as bad over the value drawdown. Again, making you say, 
it's probably not that. That is one. When you go through a near three-year tough period for a factor, you will do this exercise over and over again with other sure. hypotheses. We threw out the tech, telecom, and, and uh, industries um, to see if that were driving things. We threw out the most expensive stocks all the time and said, is it the extremes? None of it worked. Um, we measured this thing we call the value spread, just the difference between cheap and expensive, and any way we did it, in very robust ways, taking very seriously all the possible stories out there, it still was super wide at the end of 2020. Now, you can never disprove a negative. If someone says, maybe there's something out there you're missing, they're right. But I investing is, it, it, we want it to be a, a science. It can get close at times, but there's still some art and intuition to it. If you've looked, if you have a strategy that's worked for 75 years, that looks very cheap right now, and you've really spent two or three years trying to figure out every possible reason why it could not work forever, as many say, and failed, gives you a lot of fortitude to, to, to stick with it. So there is there is no one-liner prescription. There is a keep an open mind. And by the way, you got to keep an open mind for two reasons. One, because it's simply the right thing to do. If, if we were only managing our own money, had no client in the world, I would do the same exercise. I, I, I am as concerned if I were just managing, you know, my, my own money that maybe I might be horribly wrong. But it is quite important for clients because clients will sense, they will smell if you are not doing this for real and just defending your process and not keeping that open mind and not actually sticking with it because you've really tried everything and really decided you think you're right. They will sense if you're just trying to dismiss their concerns. So it's something I'm proud of. It's something I think we've done well in the thankfully rare times we've had to do it. Whenever I go on these podcasts, I only talk about bad times. <laughs> Life's been quite good to us for 26 years, and but bad times are more interesting. Um, so it is different each time. Uh, it's the most challenging thing. I used to think, if I go back, my career basically started about 30 years ago, which is a little freakish. But if you ask me 30 years ago, coming out of uh, uh, wanting to be an academic, what's the most important thing to investing success? I'd probably give you some kind of obnoxious answer about uh, just being great at building your models, being a, a, geni a, a genius model builder. 30 years later, I will not dismiss that. This will this will be bold. I know genius is good. It's good. It's, it's good. The amount of long-term investing success that is not about genius, that is about sticking with something through its inevitable tough times, if you truly still believe in it, that is much harder than it sounds. It is much harder than when you're 30 years ago looking at a long-term back test and going, well, it's worked back to 1926, and you look at these couple dips along the way and you're like oh yeah of course we would have stuck with that that's because you know where it ends up during those dips that was two and a half years of everyone calling you a moron um so the amount of success in investing that comes from that open-mindedness about whether you're right or wrong and then fortitude if you do decide you are right it's not all of it if you have a random number generator for a model then you are making a mistake, sticking with it forever. So you do need a good process. But it is much more of an even split between those two things. 30 years ago, I would have said the ball game is about being smarter than other people. And again, that's still a good thing. Uh, but the ball game is at least half about being more open-minded. And if you pass those open-minded tests, being maybe the opposite of open-minded in some sense, being more stubborn. If. Well, that was. I I can't remember what we asked you. That was such a. You, that was so awesome. I know. What hey, I, do, I do that intention. I do that intentionally. No. Sometimes no, was, at the end yeah. of answering something, I'll say, no. "Did I even cover yeah. any part of your question?" Well, well, no, because one of the future questions we were going to have was philosophies of AQR, and you really dove into that. But what I want to talk about is some things you just mentioned. For 30, 30 years ago, right? You started this company. A lot of smart people start companies. The company's twenty six years old. I started trading this stuff thirty years ago. Okay, apologies. Twenty six years ago, started AQR. 
what made AQR successful? I mean, your leadership, the team, what does it take? Because let's just remember this. We've got financial advisors listen to this, RAAs listen to this, small businesses. What are some of the key building blocks to a company that can be successful? You've got all the smarts, but that's part one, right? What made your sure. company this successful, you think? Okay. Well, part one is is pretty important. I, I, I yeah, think we've done right. well for people over the long term. Um, not with people who've sold us near the bottom, I'll admit that. But for people who've stuck with us, I think we've, I think we've done, mm-hmm. I, I, I think we've done well. And 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 you don't get to be a decent sized firm for 26 years. The world mm-hmm. figures that out if you're, if you're not. But like we've been talking about, um, that's the, the, that's necessary, but not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think you've asked me to brag basically because you've said <laughs> why have you been successful. Why not? Why not? So I feel I feel a little hey. bad about it. Uh, but I think that communication level. Um, that, that you, that people sense you're always trying to make things better, that, that people think they're getting an honest answer when things are doing well or poorly, um, that you're introspective, that you share as much as you can. There are things you cannot share and we can get into that. There's always a line, but that communication side to give people confidence to stick with it for the long term. that that's again, half the ball game. All right, take three. We're not sure what just happened. Sonu and I now dropped off cliff, so we're, we're all taking turns on having issues. But um, the, the, the world knows I used to be short tech stocks, and they're pissed off. Eh, whatever I think it that's is. that's what it is. Whatever it is. But that's an gr- <laughs> amazing answer that you just gave us there. I want to dig in a little bit because AQR has been so successful, and some of the things we were going to ask you about philosophy, I think you got into philosophy, which is great, but it takes a company, right? You might have a great philosophy, but if you don't have a good leadership team, if you can't communicate, um, if you can't trust people, it doesn't matter, right? For 26 years now, AQR is who they are because of these things. Thinking about a um, small business owner, an RAA, a small advisor out there, what are some things that your company's done for 26 years that's put you where you are right now? You know, sometimes uh, when, when I'm feeling particularly honest, I, I admit that I think we've stolen a fair amount of our culture. <laughs> borrowed. It's an homage. Borrowed, it's borrowed. not a thievery. Um from what I would call pre-IPO Goldman Sachs, not that I, not that Goldman Sachs isn't wonderful uh, today, but that's when I worked there, um, and the University of Chicago's PhD program, hmm. where some of our original employees and where we still source people from, and the 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 two very different parts of the culture, um, the University of Chicago part is I'll brag for my alma mater. Uh, those those finance seminars they had every Tuesday, they'd have an academic finance seminar. Sometimes it'd be someone internal, often it would be a visiting professor would come in, present a paper. They were savage, but fair. Hmm. Hmm. They were not known as warm and cuddly places. I won't name names, but there were a number of professors would go who would, as some 25 year old PhD students presenting their their life's work to that point would just go, I'm not buying it. I think you did this wrong. And, you know, I don't think I ever saw tears, but, wow. but, but, but it was a tough place, but it was always an honest place. Um, and we have tried to have very much that research culture here. We've hired some people from that environment. We've tried to keep that going. Um, and that is both very good, I think, to get end results, but it's also very good because it attracts people who want to be part of that kind of culture, who want to be rigorous, who want to be subject to peer review in that sense. The pre-IPO Goldman culture is we made a decision. uh, We originally launched with four founding partners and we hadn't really, you know, we were, I was 30. I I was a child. Um, The notion of what we were going to do three, four years from now with the partnership structure, I'm not going to pretend we thought about that in advance, but pretty quickly we decided to emulate pre-IPO Goldman Sachs and make new partners, and we've kept doing that. We've kept broadening the, the, the number. It's somewhere around 30 today. I could be off by about 20. Don't, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, it, it, it's more than 10 and less than 50. I think that's extremely motivating. I saw that at Goldman Sachs. Um, it's motivating to non-partners as a goal, and it's motivating to partners as they, they own a stake in what they, what, what they do. Um, so culturally, you know, some of this I think we were smart about. Some of it I admit we kind of fell into. There's luck in life when you grow up in the University of Chicago culture and the Goldman culture. It's probably natural to assume some of those, and I think we 
uh, the, at least the original founders were lucky enough to grow up in those two cultures. And I think those two cultures work and, and, and we've applied them and, and it's worked for us. No, that's great. I mean, one thing you mentioned is communication, right? And consistently, and you mentioned clients as well and communicating continuously and consistently with clients. Uh, I, I always try to read most of your stuff. And if, for anyone listening to this, I recommend definitely, if you're reading Cliff stuff, definitely look at the footnotes as well. <laughs> but uh what what question? I, as we were talking about this before the before we started recording, too, who comes up with the titles for uh, AQR's papers? Uh, I come up with some. Um, whoever's writing the paper often comes up. Sometimes we bandy them around by email. I'll I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, 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 I won't repeat it here because it's. I wouldn't use it again today. It's sure. it's a little risque. Uh, but we um we had a play on words. I don't know, ten, fifteen, thirty years ago. I can't remember. I remember two periods well, the last two weeks and high school. Everything else is kind of a gray area. Um, but uh, everyone always thinks that kind of out there title was me. It was actually Toby Moskowitz of Yale University, the esteemed professor. Um, Lasse Peterson, uh, uh, who uh, 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 was at NYU, he's at Copenhagen now, still an AQR partner. Uh, he is one of the best at coming up with titles I've I've ever mm. found. He doesn't come up with the play on word titles. The punny titles tend to be me. Okay. Um, there's a guy, Dan Villal on here is very good at coming up with those kind of funny titles. But Lasse will occasionally look and we'll be saying, we're writing this paper on carry strategies. And the original title is carry in the cross section of expected currency and bond returns. And L Lasse will look at it and go, why don't we just call that paper carry? Sure. And we'll go, that's such a better title. A, we're doing something a little obnoxious. We're, we're mm -hmm. implicitly um, saying that we are writing the be-all, end-all paper on carry. Mm -hmm. Two, it just has more of a drama to it, and it's as accurate. The other title is just academic filler words. Um, so I, I think the, the, everyone here is a, is a little bit of a different talent on it, but we mesh well, um, and it has become kind of a fun thing and we still write some things you know everyone remembers the fun titles we still write things that are the equivalent of the cross section of expected current and whatever um not you know if every title has to be a uh, hilarious home run or or, or 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 drama that's pushing it too far uh, but we do have fun with it the titles are are always are always a good time that's so, a lot of pressure so along those lines, and that's why I'm telling you they're not all good. I want to take the pressure down a little bit. I, I want to lower expectations. I think Sonu just reads the good the good titles. I think is what there he's telling go. us there. Yeah. But no, that's um a little along those lines of fun. I mean, you're obviously active on Twitter, right? You do a lot, but sometimes it seems like you get into it with people. How much do you like Twitter? Is it a love hate relationship? Where where does that stand? Oh, it's clearly today, love where, hate. Where is it today? Love hate. Where are you today? <laughs> ah, I, I I think I'm in a fairly good place. Okay. With Twitter today, um, by the way, my guys here are sitting here going, "Oh my God, they're asking him about Twitter." Yeah, that's what um, we do on this podcast. Nice to be asked yeah, about it. Podcast. I'm sorry, um, we like to do that. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I will tell you, this is my own view, and obviously, I'm I'm not unbiased about myself. Is the understatement of the century. Um, I keep getting drawn back to Twitter, even when I try to take hiatuses, hmm. because when it's good, the finance discussion is superb a lot of very good people fintwit famously is the shorthand for it um they're just fabulous um people i really respect get into it they share stuff they're actual dialogues that you would never get people from other firms that you respect you're going back and forth i will say this um i'm, I'm a little bit extreme if if you ask me something nicely i i'm gonna brag i think i'm i think i'm one of the nicer guys on twitter Someone asked me something nicely where I think they're genuinely trying to understand. I don't take care if I think it's a great or a terrible question. I'll write them a book nicely, trying to explain. If someone is rude to me, I think I, I do have a tendency to be rude back. <laughs> and I, 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 I've I gotten better at that. I've gotten better at just blocking or moving on. Uh, but uh, I, I maybe have my two-month chip, not my two-year chip. They're all human. Um, we can't that, that. That, could, that could be a challenge at times. Uh, Twitter people, you know, my worst ever 
was you guys know this. I accidentally waded into the meme stock controversy uh-huh. um, like two two Junes ago or something. Uh, two Junes ago, five Junes ago. It was June. That's all I remember. Um, and and those people are not nice. <laughs> if, you, if you're not a fan, if you're not a fan of the AMC. of the meme stocks, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, they they uh, imply you're a criminal, and they say vi- the the worst things humanly possible from anonymous accounts. And I did go through a stage where I felt I had to let them know how I felt about them. Mm-hmm. I am past that stage. I still get those every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people try to bring me back in if if there's an update for one of those stocks. You know, it's still down like 97 percent from when we started. But if there's an update, someone will tag me on something, and I have been able to rise above it for a little while. So. You know, I don't. I don't want to say I'm growing, uh, but there's a chance. It's, yeah. it's a good is exercise that, in self-control. Is that like the Godfather too? Just when he thought you're out, they pull you back in. You know, kind of, kind of like that's, that. That's, well, I'm looking at the clock here. We're, we're, I, go ahead, I, go. I, I don't want to fight with you, Ryan. I know, but I that's know. Godfather three. Oh, Godfather three. Thank you. Oh. No, that's all right. No, get me right. We, <laughs> we we have to make sure we're right on this podcast. Very few things what I up? know better than quantitative analysis. So, but the Godfather might be one of them. So let's go there. No, no one saw this coming. Obviously, Godfather one and two are considered the best one-two combo ever. What other good one-two combos are out there? In your opinion? Um, it's not a great one-two combo. Okay. But I think one of the best sequels that exceeded mm-hmm. sequels, sequels. Okay. It, it's it's um it, its predecessor was uh. I'm going to show my geek bona fides. That's all right. Star okay. Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Oh, really? oh yeah. wow. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That was an awesome movie. Mm-hmm. And the first one was ungainly and boring and mm-hmm. and didn't know what to do with itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there, there certainly are. I, I, obviously, every John Wick movie has exceeded the prior <laughs> one. I think you're, I agree there. Yeah. Soda and I just I, saw Bad um, Boys. But, you seen the latest Bad Boys yet? You seen Bad Boys? Yet? I have not. Soda not, and I saw good? that. Yeah, we saw it in Chicago a couple weeks yeah. ago. I loved it. I, yeah, it I think great. Bad Boys are getting better. Also, I love those. It's, bad it's boys fun. Movies. Oh, I'm yeah. dying for good movies. Yeah. I, I'll get myself in some kind of trouble. I think Disney is slowly killing two of my favorite franchises, Star Wars and Marvel. Yeah, I was they, they haven't made a very good one in a while. I was wondering so if you I'm, would pick am, Avengers Endgame one and two, or you know, I, I know you're a big superhero I, fan. I, I, I think calling that a sequel is a, is a little cheating. I think, that, you know, mm-hmm. is it a two-part single yeah. movie? Uh, but I, I have to admit, I did love those. I, I, I sat through um, uh, the, the final installment over three hours, mm-hmm. didn't get up. And, you know, I'm 57, so, <laughs> so not getting up for the, whole, for the whole movie says that I was, I was enthralled. Wow. That's, have you that's followed good. them since? The I, I, I've that's... tried to watch a few of them, and I, I've been disappointed. Supposedly, there are some new Avengers movies coming out from some of the old directors they're bringing back. So I, I won't give up hope. I'll, I'll still go see them. Um, but I, I, I've, you know, it's not even people criticize them for politics and stuff. I don't care about that. They've just not been great movies. Hmm. Um, and you now, hopefully, they did make great movies before. So there's hope they can do it again. Last question but, on this: Which yeah. one? Which one was your Please. favorite? Amongst all the Marvel movies uh, of, during the good times, I, I'll, I'll give you kind of a throwaway answer. The first original one, Iron Man. Oh, okay. Two reasons. Um, it shocked me how good it was, because, like, I I spent a life watching attempted superhero movies. Um, I I go back to the '70s watching the Lou Ferrigno Hulk show on on yeah. on Saturday morning cartoons. And they were all uniformly terrible. They they look silly. You know, it turns out that when you put spandex on real life people, yeah. they they don't look like. Eventually, maybe starting in the early two thousands with the X Men movies, they mm. they started looking better. Michael Keaton's eighty nine Batman was actually pretty good, mm-hmm. uh, but it was the Iron Man one, Robert Downey Jr. Where I'm where I'm like, this is a Marvel comic book come to life, and it looks right, and they got the tone right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it was actually a great movie. I've rewatched that movie since uh, relatively recently with one of my kids. And I think it was a very well done movie. I, I think it's right up there with the best Marvel movies. But being right up there with the best and first, right. it, it's it's the one I, 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 I would go with. I think I would concur with that. I'm a fan as well. My I'm trying to, my son's a big fan of Thor. So, uh, yeah, Except for the second one. Right. He the hasn't sec- seen second that, one was, yes. 
yeah. dark dark something dark worlds dark something yes. wasn't so great i liked the first thor and ragnarok was just one of the best yes, yes. I think and marvel as opposed to to dc has always worked the humor in Mm. where DC has been much more dark, and serious, which yeah. if you're, if you want to go down a comic book rabbit hole, it's a little weird mm. because if you go back to like the sixties and seventies, Marvel made their reputation by being more gritty and real world. Mm. You know, the, the heroes had actual problems. Um, we're going to get back to quant stuff, right? <laughs> I don't know. I was going to say, we might have to have okay. you back and talk. I think we're probably at the end. That was, that was awesome. I, I do just want to do a quick <laughs> little thing here. Uh, if you want to hear more, if you want to hear the latest from us, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. You can leave a review. We love your feedback. So we're winding down on episode 95 of facts versus feelings, investing insights with cliff Asness. This was amazing. Cliff. I in, last time investing in comic book insights. With in cliff comics look ass. They, uh, so do, I mean, you want to go to the, uh, one of the more popular questions, Questions last time. Maybe we end with this. It's another fun one. Kind of the hockey, hockey investing. You want to you want to ask Cliff that and maybe sign off on that one. Yeah, and that's your most. Yeah. Uh, that, that's your most. Yeah, it's a nice one to use because it it feels like it's not investing, but it's got a lot of investing mm-hmm. insights. I know we had a lot yeah. of time, and it is your most downloaded paper. I think it still mm-hmm. is safe to say, right? Oh, by far. Mm-hmm. Right. It's actually mildly annoying that my most downloaded paper is the only <laughs> one I've really written outside of my field. Um, so it's like no one, no one wants to talk about finance. And we're asking you, you about you, it. You put it. Yeah. Um, and it's also it's a little upsetting to ask me about because my Rangers won the President's Trophy for the best record in the NHL, mm. but lost in six games in the semifinals to the eventual champions. The yeah. the the absolutely awesome. They were an awesome team this year, Florida Panthers. Mm. Um. The idea of pulling the goalie, uh, for those who don't know, uh, you you have a hockey game where you're typically down by one. I'll argue it applies to even if you're down by more, but typically you're down by one. There's very little time left in the game. If you pull your goalie, you leave your goal wide open, you, you get to use an extra attacker. So you raise your chance of scoring because that extra attacker, but you raise their chance of scoring by considerably more. That turns out there's a, there's a reason teams have goalies. Um, it, it's not a good idea to play. So if you did this when you were tied, it would be nuts. It's a bad trade. Their chance of scoring goes up more than you. But it, imagine there's 30 seconds left in the game. Losing by two is generally, there can be cases, weird tiebreaker situations, but in generally, except for pride, is not worse than losing by one. So it is actually irrelevant if they score. So the only thing relevant is you've raised your chance of scoring. And you do that. Um, One of the immediate investment analogies uh, is options rise in value as volatility goes up. So all else equal, if you, you can think of it's also lowering the expected return because of the mismatch. But all else equal, you can think of the main effect of pulling the goalie is just ratcheting up the ball. And you're an out-of-the-money option at this point. You've effectively lost with 30 seconds to go. So you want Vol. Mm -hmm. When we we solve this, and we thought we were the first people ever to solve it, that's probably an exaggeration, but we thought we were more original than we were. It turns out there are about five papers we found while writing it, Mm. all shockingly by Canadians. (laughs) So I'd say we we blazed a trail as two Americans writing writing this paper. but the neat thing is we built a model that we think was actually a pretty cool model. It's very geeky, and I'm not going to torture people with it here, for solving the what's the optimal time to pull the goaltender. The other papers all did it to, to some degree from a little to extremely different than we did. Different models, different approaches. Almost totally consistently came up with the result that they should be pulling the goaltender down one considerably earlier than they are. They're way too conservative. In our model, um, instead of pulling it, the goaltender at the one, one and a half minute mark, which is probably fairly typical in the NHL, you should pull it with about five and a half minutes left. Hmm, wow. Okay. Maybe the result we had that shocked people the most was down by two. You should pull the goaltender with about 10 and a half minutes left in the game. And why don't people do that? Why, people don't do that because most of the time you end up looking like a moron. Mm-hmm. Because usually it doesn't work, and you lose by three. And if you're following Cliff and my co-author Aaron Brown's model, you keep it pulled. Because mm-hmm. down by three with eight minutes left, 
you yeah. have an infinitesimally larger chance of winning. It's tiny. Mm-hmm. And you, we're being a crazy, stupid optimizer here. We're not living in the real world. But if you do that, you still have an infinitesimal chance of scoring a few quick goals with the goalie pulled. And you end up losing by 19 <laughs> in the in the Cliff and Aaron world. And that's embarrassing to people. Yeah. So, but, but it is far less costly for them to pull down by one with two and a half minutes left instead of one and a half. And they don't do it. I will say they've been lengthening over the last few years. Okay. I do not attribute that to Aaron and I. I think we just caught a zeitgeist of them moving to more rational. But there are tons. And that we, we actually published this paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management. Sounds like an odd place to publish <laughs> yes, a hockey paper. It does. But the actual title was, was something uh, along the lines of when to pull the goaltender with investing implications. Because it turns out what we basically have here is a problem that we know how to solve, but that can be very hard to stick with. Because if you do it optimally and you look stupid and you do that two or three times, mm-hmm. coach can lose his job. Right. Right. You can think of this as tracking error. You mm-hmm. can think of this as it might be the optimal thing to do, but I'm inducing a lot of tracking error to peers that I could be punished for. Mm-hmm. So you end up getting a lot of analogies. Why don't people do what's optimal? Well, sometimes they just don't know, but sometimes they know and just can't pull it off. And once you once that's out in the open, though, there's a little bit of a circular effect. I think it becomes easier to pull off what's optimal when you address it up front. Hmm. Um, so there were a bunch of other ones, but there are a lot of ways to think of the why don't you do this mm-hmm. that apply to investing also. One of my favorites, which is not in hockey, um, this is a football result. Um, I, this has actually affected the NFL. Um, I don't remember how long ago. Call it 10, 15 years ago. There, there, there are these results saying coaches don't go for the two-point conversion enough, and when they're somewhere around midfield, they don't go for it on fourth down yep. enough. Um, like, say you're on the opponent's 40-yard line. The expected gain on a punt is usually 20 yards. Right? It's, you get the coffin corner sometimes, but fairly often it's, it comes out to the 20. Uh, so for 20 yards, if it's fourth and three, Maybe you should, it's probably the case you should do that, but you look really dumb when it doesn't work. Mm. And then if they get to, if they take over and march down for a touchdown, you look really dumb. But one of my favorite sub sub results of this is I believe they found that older, more experienced coaches did it more optimally, mm. not fully optimally. Mm-hmm. And I think the people who did this argue that the causality wasn't that they were geniuses, and that's how they became older and experienced. I think the causality worked that their jobs were safer. Mm -hmm. So they could afford to act more optimally. Bill Belichick, not today's Bill Bill Belichick where, you know, they've lost for a few years, but in the dynasty years, he's not going to get fired for twice turning it over on the 40. Some wet behind the ears, new coach, that might be a job threatening situation. And I think the same could be true of managers. Um, so I think there are a lot. I think it's a really neat result just unto hockey. But I do think, you know, there's no magic to hockey and there's no magic to investing. People are people. Biases are biases. Um, and and not surprisingly, they show up in different forms, but with a lot of unifying features. And I just thought that was cool. That is cool. Very no, that's it. A- that's a great way to end it. Let's not forget today's Bill Belichick has a girlfriend 40 years younger than him. So we'll just leave. I was not going to mention that. Okay, well, I guess I did. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's today's Bill Belichick. So, yeah. Yeah, let's yeah. let. I don't, I don't think any of us should take this any further because someone's going to say gonna, something to yeah, get we'll him in trouble. Leave, we'll just leave it, so, we'll just leave it there. Let's just leave it there. Yeah, he's, he's, he's doing all right. Bill is. Um, But no, thank you so much, Cliff, for joining us once again. And the partnership, obviously, with AQR and Carson Group is, is first notch. Um, We really appreciate everything. And, you know, hey, maybe another year or so we'll get to do this a third time and talk a little bit more about movies next time because yes. i think that was really uh, an interesting conversation <laughs> yeah so. we, we 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 should do it and just skip the finance yeah, you know yeah, why not? You go. we go all yeah. over the place but yeah. every yeah thank you all so right. much you, again well Cliff. oh go ahead final comments go ahead Cliff. no we love we love you guys you guys are amazing partners mm-hmm. um and anytime you want me back um the only question is how much your audience can take anytime <laughs> you guys want me you got me uh, we, we even had two little hiccups and we went a long time but I think yeah. this is one of our best podcasts ever we've done almost 100 of them and I mean that so Cliff thank you Absolutely. again thank you to all listeners everybody Sona and I will be back next week to do it all again thank, thank you care, everyone. Cliff. thank you
Information provided on Facts vs. Feel and some of our geese and Ryan Dietrich are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. The statements and opinions of show guests may not be reflective of CWM LLC or its affiliates. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested in directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Facts versus Feelings are not affiliated with CWM LLC.